My legs last week were covered in bruises and I had some people give me some weird looks because my legs were covered in bruises. Mesdames et messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! You can do it! You can do it! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello and welcome to another episode of Olympic Fever, the podcast for Olympics fans. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you doing today? I am great. There has been lots of celebrating going on. We had Canada Day this week. Yes. We had the 4th of July this week. Independence Day. Yes. And I don't know if you saw this, but Team Olympic Fever, Ariel's coach... Emily Cook got engaged. <gasps> did she really? Oh she my gosh. Did. Oh, congratulations, Emily. She did. Oh. She posted a picture and her dad was there and their dog was there and it was fantastic. Oh, so that, that made my whole week. <laughs> oh, that is nice. Oh, I will have to go online and look for those. We'll look for those pictures. I'm excited. Oh. That's exciting. Good for her. I know. That made me so happy. Oh, that's cool. Oh, man. It's hot, though. I know it's hot by you. It's hot by me. Yeah. (laughs) It just makes me want to jump in a pool. Yes. Which is appropriate because we are going in the pool in today's episode. Our guest today is Canadian Olympic synchronized swimmer Jacqueline Simoneau, who competed in the duet competition with Corinne Thomas at Rio 2016, where they placed seventh and they earned an Olympic diploma. Corinne has since retired, so Jacqueline is on the hunt for a new duet partner, but she is also competing in the team and solo events. Now, if you remember when Synchro Swim was introduced in 1984, they had solo on the the program, and they took it off three Olympics later. But they still compete that in international competition, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, they did not have the team competition. I think it was just right. solo and duet when they started out. Yeah, but they still do it in international competition. And the other interesting difference between the two is that in regular FINA competition, they have the technical and free programs are separate events. So, Oh, it's yeah. not a combined score. No, in the Olympics it is. Just like in figure skating, they have the combined score of technical and free program, but in other competition, they're two separate events. Huh. Well, you know what I found out this year, similar to figure skating, they give out little small medals for the people who place first, second, and third in the short program. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Yeah. So So I guess that's not atypical. I guess that's not unique. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. More we'll to, have to look into that. Yes, I know. That, more for us more, to do. More. Yeah. <laughs> Take a listen to my interview with Jacqueline. I caught up with her at a Tim Hortons in suburban Montreal, and she talked oh, to me God, through. That's so Canadian. <laughs> it was. It was. <laughs> and it was packed. It was a jam packed Timmy Ho Ho's. I will talked tell you that. <laughs> at a Tim Hortons. Of course you did. <laughs> And among the things we talked was about the ins and outs of the sport. So take a listen. Let's go over the basic moves. Okay. So you have with your hands, if you're just treading water, basically, mm-hmm. what are you doing? What are those called? I mean, for us at this point, I mean, we're so efficient in the water that we don't really need to tread water or do egg beater. It's also called egg beater. Okay. Uh, we mostly just float. For the most part, uh, it's most of when we're upside down. So when our head is underwater and our legs are up, those are that's when all the difficult and complex techniques of our arms to support us come and play. Okay. Then you have different types of lifts, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Talk me through some of them. Okay. The main one, I suppose, is a bonkin. And it's, it's called a bonkin. <laughs> it's what they do in the in circus sometimes when they throw some people up in the air. Yeah. They have this base, a base of two people, and these two people grab hands and, and walk arms. Mm-hmm. And the person who they're shooting up in the air is standing on their hands, linked okay. together. Okay. And then they start to swing the person up, and then they lift the person and go up. So obviously we don't have a floor to stand on, so our floor is basically the people treading water and supporting us. So. We usually have seven people throwing one person up in the air, and the, the person has enough air time to do at least a double backflip. Wow. And is it the stronger you are, the higher you can throw them up? or Strength does have quite a play in it, but it's also 
the efficiency and it's all about the timing because okay. uh, in the circus they only have two people so you don't have to synchronize two people to throw one person up okay. but in the water it's seven people pushing one person so if one person pushes early or late it affects the timing completely and it, and it affects the height or the amount of air time the person will get. That's interesting. And do you, is it like circles of you all and you just kind of push on each other all at once? Or <laughs> are you um, up uh, layers? Of there's uh, different layers. Uh, okay. So there's the people who are the arms. So people, the two people who lock arms together okay. each have a person behind them at their hips holding their hips and okay. they're going to propulse them up out of the water. And none, none of the time we're touching the bottom. So we're always right. treading water and egg beatering and, and doing whip kicks at the moment where we launch the person up in the air. Okay. Uh, but right below the arms, right below the hands actually where the people lock, there's somebody upside down okay. and they're having their feet up against the arms so then they push themselves oh up. Oh my gosh. And okay. underneath these legs, there's two people under supporting these legs. Holy, okay, so you have, <laughs> on the bottom, yep. you have two people who are holding two people who are upside down with their feet up, but they're not, they're in the middle of the water somewhere. Yep. And they're pushing up on the arms of the two people who are holding and throwing up the person who actually gets to jump out exactly. and, and yep. get a breath. <laughs> yep. right? Which person are you in this? <laughs> um, I, I kind of play a number of roles. I, okay. I Sometimes I'm the person where they launch up in the air okay. and do all the flips and jumps, mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes I'm some of the people, the arm people pushing up. Do they switch you around just because of like, uh, the stamina or um, is it a certain look yes, place? but also the person who is on the top so the person who does all these flips uh, you're more prone to injury Okay. and at the, the position that I'm in right now I'd, I'd rather uh, or at least I'd rather not get injured so right. it's always safer to be the safest well, in my opinion the safest position in this so-called bonk in mm -hmm. is the uh, being at the hips of the arms okay of the people who launch up so that okay. you're you're not really at risk of injury, and that's where the coaches usually place me because it's usually safer. And the people who do the solo duet and team events tend to be in the lower risk positions in these. Okay. Just, just to save, yeah, pace people. ourselves and everything. How, how much do you get kicked during <laughs> one of these movies? Kicked because of uh, after uh, a No, because or, like somebody Because there's something close together. Yeah, just being close oh, together. Oh, yeah. like really okay. often. Uh, my legs last week were covered in bruises, and I had some people give me some weird looks because my legs were covered in bruises. Because uh, it's something that you wouldn't really think, you know, from the outside being in a spectator position, but we, we swim really close together in a right. team or even a duet. And treading water, uh, when you're a couple inches away from somebody, obviously right. you're going to hit and lock legs. And we're not wearing shin pads like we do in soccer. I mean, we were at their bare legs, so it's get beat up. You know, somebody could make like sequin shin guards. I would be okay for that. <laughs> I, I would like that. Down. Allison, we're going to make some sequin shin guards. We're going to make some sequin shin guards. Note that. Yeah. When you accidentally lock legs with somebody, like, do you both just start sinking or what? <laughs> or you just go, oh, dang. Um, obviously the instinct is to start sinking. So if yeah. you get a really big kick, I mean, you're you're pulled down underwater, okay. but uh, you could get penalized for this in your routine, so oh, we, we just okay. continue as if nothing happened. Okay. Wow. If you were the person being launched, like, that's prone to injury. Yeah. So what, like, what injuries? Like, you, know, you don't, you belly flop, maybe? <laughs> oh, yeah, or, you're belly flopping, but it's not actually too common to belly flop. Okay. It's actually... Uh, sometimes when you come out of a double backflip, you could either elbow somebody in the head, or you could your head can land on that person's feet who are pushing you up. Oh my gosh! Okay. So there's been a lot of head and neck injuries, okay. or elbows landing on heads, knees okay. kneeing people in heads. Okay. That right Something there. that you wouldn't really think about the right. sport. So and when when you do a team event, like do you have a prescribed number of lifts that you have to do? In the, at least in the free portion, because are the technicals everybody does the same routine? Yeah, so the technical routine, you have to have a minimum of two lifts. Okay. Uh, one is one big lift where you throw one person up in the air, and then you also have to have two lifts. Okay. So where you're, you're split four and four, and you have to lift two people oh, cool. up in the air. Okay. So those are pretty neat. Yeah. And then in the free routine, you're pretty much free to do whatever whatever you choose to do. So some countries get really creative mm -hmm. at this. I mean, Ukraine is, is known for their highlights. Uh, they throw people up in the air really high, and they do really crazy acrobatic moves and okay. it's pretty neat to watch. Let's go to the beginning of a routine. Okay. You're on the, the deck. Um, well, no, let's go back one further. <laughs> Costumes. Talk to me about the costume. You have a suit. A lot. I see a lot of sequins. Yeah. A lot of netting. Yeah. <laughs> How comfortable is it? Are they 
spandexy or not? I mean, some some suits are more comfortable than others. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's, it's obviously a, a normal speedo suit is the most comfortable yeah. there is. Uh, just because of the sequence, sometimes the way they're placed in the suit, if they're placed close to the underarm, sometimes your arm yeah. can rub on it. But okay. I mean, it's something that you don't really notice. You're only wearing it for a couple of minutes, anyways. Okay. So it um, just on. How much do those run, if I can ask? How much do they cost? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it depends. I mean, our Olympic suits, one Olympic suit itself was $1,000. Get out of town. Yeah. <laughs> no. Holy cow. <laughs> so that's right up there with figure skating. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm guessing there are people who design synchronized swimming costumes. Yeah, well, actually, uh, people who do figure skating costumes are the same ones who do synchronized swimming costumes as well. That's a nice little sideline for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you have that. You usually, do you almost always have a headpiece that goes with it? Usually. If you want to look professional, as they call it in our sport, you usually wear a headpiece. I'm not a big fan. <laughs> no. <laughs> how, how come? Um, one, just because of the time it takes to put it on before. Okay. I could be using that time to stretch or warm up or keep my body warm, but instead uh -huh. I'm, I'm putting on a headpiece and pinning it in my hair. Okay. And uh, I don't know if it gives that much of a result or outcome if we get, we don't necessarily get judged on a headpiece. Right. But, so. but for some reason that's the thing. For some reason it's the norm. It's not written in the rule book that you should have one, but it's highly recommended that you do. Bathing caps would be great though. I hear you. Because then you also, what's up with the hair slipping back? <laughs> yeah, so what we put in our hair is, is gelatin. Okay. So the, the stuff that you use to make jello at home, yeah. just without the flavoring and the food color. Okay. So to, for a prank, do you ever sweat and swap someone's gelatin for like colored gelatin? <laughs> no, that, that's a good idea though. <laughs> I like that. It's a full Yeah. <laughs> Some people are different. I mean, I'm, I'm quite efficient with my gel. I usually use two packs of gel, and that, that does me for the day. Some people use six or eight. Uh, but I mean, with the experience that I've got, I usually just yeah. use two, and I'm fine. Okay. Uh, how, how comfortable is that to wash out? The thing is, a lot of people complain that it's, it's terrible to wash out. It's not that bad if you do it right after you finish swimming. There's okay. some people who wait hours and they go eat and they still have their hair in and then you, the gelatin in your hair gets really, really hard. It's rock hard. Okay. And then that takes a lot of hot water to get out and lots of shampoo and even then you still have little bits and pieces left in your hair. So <laughs> if you wash out your hair right after, it is good to go. <laughs> it's not dandruff, it's gelatin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then makeup. Yeah. The judges like makeup. And is it all, I guess it's all waterproof, or are you just hoping it stays waterproof enough for the show? Uh, I mean, some water, uh, some makeup that I use is not waterproof, okay. and I honestly just have to put a lot more on for it to stay. Okay. But the majority of my makeup, the mascara, the eyeliner, is all waterproof, and you just okay. have to put a lot more on because you're, you're swimming further away from the judges, so it's like a ballet. You okay, just yeah. have to put it on also interesting. I, I, I have thoughts about that. It's just, <laughs> These are not my favorite weird. parts. I mean, yeah, it's, it's very it's strange. It's very you know, like, you talk about little kids and being in the pool, like, yeah. you've got makeup coming off. <laughs> yeah, and gelatin all over the pool. I mean, the gutters and the whole pool system after competitions is just gel, oh, gel and everything. Man, I would hate to be the pool maker. That's great. That's why we should wear bathing caps and right? don't, need, don't need makeup right? either. I and mean, they can be pretty caps. special. Like, I saw little ones. They had sharks on them. Like, oh, oh yeah, man, that'd you know, be that's cute. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Doing jaws routine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, got the jelly that nose plugs. Oh yeah. Essential. Right? Yes. Okay. Crucial. Um, uh, ear plugs too or no? Nope. No. Okay. Then on the deck, mm -hmm. getting ready. How, do you have a pres prescribed amount of time or a, like up to amount of time yep. that you have to like before you get into the water? What do you call that? Uh, so we call it our deck work or our okay. walk on, I okay. suppose. Okay. Uh, so we have a maximum of 30 seconds to walk on to the pool. Sometimes we do a little dance or we just walk on and we go into our position and we have okay. 30 seconds to do that. Okay. If we pass these 30 seconds, we get a penalty. Okay. How much of a penalty? One point. One point. Okay. Yeah. And how many does it uh, deduct from a. Do you start with a high score and you take points off or do you just add points? 
from a zero? That's a good question. So it depends. Some judges start uh, at a 10 and then they work their way down, or some okay. just give an overall score. There's nothing really that's predetermined. However, they are working on a new scoring slash judging system uh, that's probably going to mimic a little bit of figure skating, too. So be curious to see when that comes out. Or are they talking um, about it this year? Or? Not too sure. They've done a couple of test events. Okay. Uh, and they're trying to make it uh, more objective, too, and make it more uh, like in figure skating. Yeah. When you uh, actually execute an element properly, you get an X amount of points. You get that little green oh, yeah. dot yeah. that you see at the top yeah. of the screen. So we're working towards that. Interesting. So you do the deck work, and does it, is that two music sometimes, always, never, awesome? Uh, our routines are always to music. Okay. Uh, the deck work or the part that we actually walk on uh, is not to music. Okay. When do you start the syn? Is that weird? But when do you start the synchronization? But like, how do you get when you're walking on? You're like, do you like five, six, seven? Somebody yeah. you got a captain who is yeah. like, all right, here we go. Yeah. I got so the time. usually I cue the team, uh, say five, six, seven, eight, and then you start walking on one. Okay. And our steps are all predetermined, so it depends on the pool. Some pools are two sets of eight, two sets okay. of eight of walking, or about okay. you know, 12 steps, okay. or uh, 20 steps, I mean. Okay. Uh, and then we get into our position and then go. All right. And then always diving at first, yes? Or you Usually sometimes? diving, you can do a backflip, you can jump, you can start in the water, because technically we're only started uh, to be judged once we're in the water. Really? So the first 10 seconds, we're allowed 10 seconds on the side of the deck part before we get in. So the music starts and we're allowed 10 seconds on land before we jump in the water. Okay. But those 10 seconds aren't judged, they just give an impression. So they may affect your impression score, okay. but they're not technically supposed to judge it. So you could start in the water if you like. But nobody does. Some people do. Really? Yeah, it has happened. I mean, there's one routine that I swam in Beijing uh, yeah. four years ago and we started in the water and that, that oh, worked okay. just fine okay. too. What is the difficulty then? Because if you're you're starting in the water, although I guess you're you're doing your like beaters, yeah, and that gets you going. Because sometimes I guess my brain is going, well, you dive in and you've got that momentum from the dive. Exactly. To get you started. Yeah. That's the advantage actually of diving okay. in because uh, part of our artistic impression mark is our propulsion. So how much we move across the pool. Usually a typical routine has about four laps. Um, and if you do less than that, you'll get penalized. And okay. you have to travel lengthwise and widthwise. And if you don't dive in, you don't get that initial momentum. Oh, okay. And usually when you dive in, you're able to at least cover about half the 25 meter pool. So you already have your momentum going in your first lap. Okay. Versus if you start in the water, you're at a disadvantage of okay. not having that momentum in the beginning. Okay. That's interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit about music. We have one of our listeners, listener Meredith, wanted to know how you hear the music under the water. Oh. And then if you have any funny stories about not being able to hear the music. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yes, we can hear the music underwater. And believe it or not, sound does actually travel faster underwater than it does Oh, really? Water. So yeah. when you come up... Can you be like a happy They have they have it synchronized okay. for both of us. So when we okay. when we're in the water, it's the same as if it's playing above water. Okay. Uh, so we always hear it and we always count our music. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Our music is to count. So if ever we do not hear the music, we always have the counts to rely on. But it's obviously harder to synchronize when you don't hear the music underwater. Okay. And a funny story, actually, at the World Championships in Kazan in Russia in 2015, um, our music stopped playing underwater at the final know. event, the combination event. And sometimes, well, we actually had this code with our coach that I'd grab my ear and I'd pull it down a little bit, discreetly, obviously, with the routine, very, very quickly. And these, making, we were making these little like signs and, and hoping that our coach would be able to see it and tell the referee, but she didn't notice. So we just continued on. And in this case, we just count. And we also do what's called beeping underwater. So it's this, um, it's, it's kind of like talking underwater, but you're, you're saying the counts out loud. And because we're so we're close enough in the team, we're able to hear these counts if someone counts in their water. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about like bubbles floating up or just no. like, get out of town. <laughs> now I have something to try. Next time. Ah. Um, all right. How do you build up the stamina to stay underwater now? Because you're underwater for about how much? Of, okay, let's say. You're just a freeze. A free, are they the same amounts of time? They're different times. The free routine is about four minutes, okay. and we're under for I'd say at least seventy-five percent of it. Okay. And then the, the technical is what? 
Techno is about 2.30. Okay. And that time. Same thing, about three quarters. Okay, so say you got to build up a good three, three and a half minutes of yeah. water for a good time. And when you get up, how much time do you really get to breathe? I mean, I, I would assume that choreography is mapped out strategically to give you some breathing time or like resting time in between being underwater. And yeah, I mean there's technically never a rest in our routine because even when we are breathing, uh, our legs are working really hard to support right. ourselves out of the water. We're constantly moving. So our, we never really have a rest. Our rest is kind of like an active recovery rest, I guess, during okay. routine. But we at least don't hold our breath for a three minutes straight. We have right. Excuse me, little segments of where okay. we hold our breath. So typically our first lap, so the first minute of the routine, we're under for, it depends. I mean, this summer I swam a team where I was under for the first 52 seconds of that one minute. Okay. And that was a really hard lap because I'm under for a lot, and that makes you more tired for the rest of the routine, puts you in an aerobic state. Okay. And then your last lap, so the last, the 30 seconds of your routine is when you're usually under for the most time because that's when you want to show the most difficulty oh, yeah. with your legs and always show your legs that execute difficult movements. Okay. What is a uh, more difficult um, There's a couple of difficult ones. There's one uh, that's called a thrust. And a thrust is um, when you start with your toes coming up first, okay. and you start in this underwater pike position, mm -hmm. and then you um, unroll your body so that your, your toes come up, and you could sometimes even get up to about, I'd say your breastbone about there. Oh. Wow, so, you get yourself that high yeah, up on so the water. one person, it's all about efficiency and the pressure, the water pressure on your arms. So that's a difficult movement, and it, it's kind of fun to do, honestly. <laughs> and then there's another one of my favorites, uh, it's, it's spinning, pretty much. So you're upside down, and you have your toes up, and you, you have what's out of the water from your toes to, I'd say, about mid to three quarters of a thigh. Okay. And you just stay up there, and you spin. Okay. Uh, and do turns and turns, and it's, it's cool, because there's a lot of complex arm techniques that you have to do to be able to do that. Out. Is it harder to synchronize people spinning? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's more prone to solo events or duet okay. events. Okay. Okay. But there are spins and team routines as well. There are are technical elements in front of the person. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, do you have a favorite out of like between doing solo, duet, team? It's a good question. Um, it's, I don't think I could pick one because, I mean, solo it's fun because you could progress so much faster uh, as an individual. I mean, you see the progress day in, day out. And um, in the duet event, I mean, working with somebody so close, um, you get to know them really well. And uh, almost up to the point, I mean, before the Olympics with Corinne, she'd lift a finger and I know exactly what she was going to do. Oh, wow. uh, you get to know somebody so well. So that's, that's kind of neat. You, you form this partnership and this bond. And with a team event, uh, there's something just so rewarding about achieving something as a team. I mean, putting everybody together and working towards one common goal, it's just something that's really, really special. Yeah, well, and to have to do everything identically the same, mm -hmm. as close as possible, is, that is so challenging. And that's really kind of the cool part of watching the sport. Let's talk about how you got into this. So another listener, listener Susan, asked if you got your foundation in dance or swim. Oh, that's a good question. Actually, neither. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was a water baby growing up, but I, I started actually in hockey. Really? So I played oh, hockey. Canada, for, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, our, it's our national sport, right? Uh, but I went through kind of a loop of sports. I mean, from hockey, I went into to tennis and soccer for a couple of years, and then I went into uh, some water sports. So I did do swimming for a little bit of time, played water polo, and then I really got into diving. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I love diving. And actually, the moment that I started to dive is the moment that I knew I wanted to go to the Olympics. Really? Yeah. Um, I actually was fortunate enough to, to be able to watch Emily Haymans, who's one of our famous Canadian divers, dive. And she's been to a couple Olympics, and she, I watched her train for the 2008 Olympic Games, and I just saw how determined she was. And, and there's some dives she would she'd fall flat on her face and belly flop, and then she'd get right back up on that tower and do it again and nail it. And there's just something so fascinating about that uh, that just made me want to become an Olympic athlete. And I didn't really go into diving, continue further on into that. I, I sometimes, not that I would have read it, I mean, I'd be curious to see where I'd be at today if I would have continued with diving. Okay. Uh, but I did do diving and synchronized swimming for a while. 
because I saw synchronized swimming one day across the pool from diving, and I thought that was cool because they were throwing a girl up in the water, okay. out of the water, and she was kind of diving but without a diving board, and I thought that was cool. So that's when I started to try it. Okay, and what made you fall in love with synchro? Um, what I love the most about synchro is that it's it's different from any other sport. So we have a lot of sports that complement our sport. So I still do diving to this day to train my acrobatic moves, and I do a lot of running, a lot of biking, weightlifting, speed swimming, uh, ballet, gymnastics, Pilates. So I love how there's just you need to have so much of a good base of a background to be able to do this sport, and it's always different every single day. It's not just speed swimming where it's four different strokes. You get to, for the synchro, I mean, you could do a million and one things, which is a good because I did want to ask you about what's a training day like or a week like because it sounds like you have a lot of basic uh, base training and other stuff you have to do. Yeah, so how much time do you actually spend in the water a day on a given day? I mean, it honestly depends all on our, on our training phase or where we are in the year. Okay. Before a competition, the majority of our time is spent in the water perfecting those routines and getting them really synchronized. But um, on an off season, which is typically for us September to November, um, we'd spend maybe four, five, six hours in the water a day. All I can think about is how how fruity your fingers get. <laughs> Honestly, I've become immune to it. So my really? fingers yeah, do not get fruity. Wow. However, if I do take a week to ten days off and I go back in the water, then they start to get fruity again. But if I train six days on, on seven uh -huh. continuously, I'm a yes, how? Yeah. Now I know what to do. <laughs> just, there we go. Yeah. You don't like fruity fingers, just get in the water for some yeah. hours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, when, this isn't a great question, but because it's, it's going to vary from the, like, how long does it take to learn a routine generally? And that's going to vary with your, I mean, when you're doing it with a team. It depends from person doing, to person, yeah. honestly. Okay. Um, I'm quite pick at, uh, quite quick at picking up choreography and routines and counts because I've had a number of years experience and I'm quite visual so I know how to learn a routine, how I pick it up quickly and it takes me I'd say three hours for a routine of four, four minutes. Okay. Um, and within a routine of four minutes, I mean there's thousands and thousands of counts and every right. count has a movement. Uh, but because routines are structured so similarly, it's easy for me to pick it up. Okay. Uh, but some people I'd say who have been in the sport for about 10 years, it still takes them a couple of days to a week or two to be able to actually learn the routine in itself. Okay. That's interesting. And then do you, how does your coach give notes? I mean, like, <laughs> do you get, like, do you go through a routine and say, okay, here's where you're not synchronized, this count is where you got to get in sync, or do you watch footage, or what, you know, do you watch film a lot to figure That's out? It's actually a really, really good question. Okay. Um, so there's, there's lots of ways to, to correct ourselves. So first of all, we're, we're judged also on our execution. Our execution is kind of like our line in the water. So for example, if we have our toes up and our heads underwater, and we're in this, what we call a vertical position, so we're vertical upside down, we could be crooked, we could be on our face or on our back, we could be angled, and that plays into our synchronization. So one of the first things our, our coaches coach us on uh, is, our, is our lines in the water. So if one of us is 45 degrees on an angle and one of us is straight, that's going to make a huge impact in our synchronization. So the coaches have to have a really fine-tuned eye for the for these lines. And then secondly is also the counts too. So um, two people could be on the correct counts and one person could be a little late or early, so they have to have this eye to see you know, all about the timing. Then we do uh, use a lot of video footage, uh, usually after a couple of months of training a routine because usually it takes months to, to sift through these alignment corrections, these timing corrections. The moment we get to the fine tuning part is when we watch our videos of our routines in slow motion. Okay. And then we tend to pause the video on certain movements and then we're able to see things in details, you know, finger positions, if one pinky is out a little bit, it's the small, fine, fine, fine details that will make a difference. How does a judge see a pinky finger from across? I guess they can. <laughs> they have really good um, Maybe the judges won't see it, uh, we but it. we know it and I mean we're, we're aiming for perfection, right? So any little thing can make, make a difference. Okay, so do you have, when you practice, I know, uh, at least in the pool at the Olympic Center, they've got above, you know, you have the deck, and then you have below water, you can see through those pool holes. Yeah. Cool. Do you have, like, two coaches, one up and one down, who are figuring out the synchronization, like, seeing the <laughs> synchronization? Yeah. Because you kind of also have to be 
somewhat synchronized on your knees to be synchronized up there? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So we're technically not judging if we're synchronized underwater, although you can see some synchronization underwater. Uh, but we use um, one of our guys who's in biomechanics, he films us underwater. Okay. And then what's part of also our video review and fine tuning our routines is watching these underwater videos because most of the time uh, when we're treading water, if our legs aren't exactly synchronized, it means that we're not synchronized above water. Okay. Same thing for when we're upside down to where our complex arm techniques, if our arms aren't synchronized in spin skulls or, or what we call support skull, then we're not going to be synchronized above water. So we do look at those footages as well. Anything else we haven't talked about, like the basics of this book? And you get it's a 10.0 scale. Yep. Okay. And there are what, about five judges or so. Mm. Usually, or that's a good question. I should know this. Um, <laughs> As okay. The judges are split up, so there, there's a, an X amount of judges in execution, an X amount of judges in okay. difficulty, and, and some in artistic impression. So they're okay. split up. Okay. Um, and then for our technical routines, there's only a certain amount of judges that only look at our elements. Okay. Elements, nothing else. Okay. And then there's judges who look at uh, the difficulty, the execution routine, and judges who look at artistic impression. Uh, and then I'd have to take a wild guess, and then you could probably verify this. It'd be about 15, maybe to 20 judges. So I'd say it'd be split up on both ends okay. of the pool. Uh, either 10 on 10 on both ends. Okay, I didn't realize that they were split up on different sides. And yeah. And that makes a difference because you can see on um, yeah, you can see on either side. <laughs> yeah, and it'd be funny, sometimes uh, these panels on either side of the pool aren't exactly aligned. Okay. And so one judge who's on the far end of the panel doesn't exactly see what the judge on the other side of the pool sees. So sometimes you can see a variation in the marks of which judge was sitting on what side of the pool. Oh, so this is all where it comes into play where you can place certain movements in the routine strategically so some judges see some things and some judges don't see other things. So if you have a weakness and you want to hide it, you know exactly where to strategically place it in your routine. Wow! <laughs> oh, that's blowing my mind. When you're spinning underwater, do you get dizzy? Um, it's a good question. So, for the most part, no. For example, team routine spins, uh, so when we do a spin in, in team routine, they're generally slower, uh, just for synchronization purposes, so then I don't get dizzy. Duet spins, same thing. They're generally faster than a team, but still not fast enough where you get dizzy. But in solo, um, some soloists don't have the ability to pick up that amount of speed, but the, the soloists who are able to pick up a, a significant amount of speed, you definitely get dizzy after. And in one of my solos, this solo that I competed last week, I, I do uh, you know, at least 15 to 20 spins in, in one breath. And I go up and I go down and up and down and up and down. And in those cases, sometimes I get dizzy, sometimes I don't. Uh, yeah. Far out, man. <laughs> Listener Meredith also asked about men in synchronized swimming. Oh, yeah. And I know that there are mixed duets yes. now. Have you ever thought about doing a mixed duet? <laughs> are there many Canadian male synchro swimmers? There's not that many male <laughs> Canadian synchro swimmers. I, there's, I mean, two or three that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh -huh. um, and we had a mixed duet compete at the World Championships last summer in Budapest, who did fairly well. And maybe it's something that I'll consider down the road. Okay. Uh, but for now, I've got my plate full and my three yeah. events there, so I'm okay. pretty pleased with these three. Okay. Because it's interesting when you, I was just diving into, diving into, get, digging into a little bit of, um, when I was doing some re the research, and of course we have the, the Saturday Night Live. Yeah, that's yeah, of course. Everyone knows. Classic. <laughs> and um, but I guess there are some countries where they do have more of a men's presence. Yeah. And uh, it's just interesting to see how I know at, the, at least at the Olympic level they talk about gender parity, but hey, you've got two events that men don't compete in, yeah. and synchro is one, and it's interesting to to think well. Is that ever going to build up or enough men would be interested in to compete? Uh, I think they're pushing them. actually to have it uh, featured in one of the coming out of the games, really? not for Tokyo, but perhaps 2024. Okay. It is picking up on the World Series circuit and also at the World Championships level. There is a, a fair amount of participation in the event and it's, it's quite competitive. I mean, uh, some of the top countries in the world, like Russia, US, you guys have a great duet um, that competes and they actually won gold at the World Championships oh, wow. uh, last summer. So. Wow. Oh, something to look into. Yeah. 
far out. Well, and, and Paris makes sense because I think France seems to be pretty into it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they have a good mix duet going okay. on too. Um, would they ever try to get solo into the Olympics? It was in the Olympics, actually, I believe, oh, until well, yeah, it was. 96. It was yeah. Whole, yeah, and then they took it away. Yeah. And do you think they'd ever bring it back? I mean, I'd love for them to bring it back. It'd be fun. Uh, but I guess it all depends. I, I, from what I've heard, the IOC only has a certain amount of events that they can have in the Olympics. Right. And there's also a marketing aspect to consider in all this, too. So it depends. So speaking of marketing, how's your funding? I talked with a fencer the mm -hmm. other day. And she's like, yeah, we don't have, there's no money. Yeah, there's no yeah. money for us. <laughs> No, there's honestly not much funding. I mean, here in Canada, we're lucky. We have what's called the carding system. Mm -hmm. So if you're uh, an athlete who has competed at the Olympic or World Championships level, you get uh, a card. And a card is an X amount of money per month to be able to help support yourself financially for uh, you know, housing or your, your training fees. But it's, it's really not enough. It's, it's not enough to cover everything. Uh, but I've been very fortunate to have a couple of sponsors who have helped me throughout the way. I mean, uh, the Hudson's Bay Company, which is a traditional cleaning company, who has they sponsored 50 athletes for five years, 25 winter, 25 summer, and I'm very, very fortunate to be one of those 25 summer athletes. So it, it helps me tremendously. And I mean, there's there's companies like um, this company called Atmos Five. You imagine, no, they build parks for for cities, and okay. they sponsored me uh, since 2011. So they have a, you know, helped me a lot, cover my training costs and everything too. That's got to be a relief because there's so many people who. Well, I, I know some of the winter athletes who are talking like, yeah, there's so many Olympians that are underneath the poverty level and they're yep. just scraping to get by. It's, it's but amazing. even then, I mean, with all these bursaries, it, it's yeah. still not enough to, to support all my training fees and my competition fees and whatnot. Okay, yeah. So, so oh, lucky to have to pay for all your stuff out of pocket. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Blowing. I, well, I would say you're blowing a thousand bucks on costumes, <laughs> and you're doing that for more than one costume a year. <laughs> so it's like at least three. Or do you have? Wait. So if <laughs> Fina. <laughs> so if you have to have a technical routine, if technical is one event and free is another, you gotta have two different, two different suits. suits. Yes. Yeah. For this year, actually, for my technical solo event, I borrowed a suit from somebody else who was not competing at the international level, so I was able to save a couple hundred dollars on that. Thank goodness. Uh, but for next year, being a World Championships year, I'm going to have to invest some money into some costumes for that. Okay, so World Champs are every two years? Yeah. Okay, and then so... Then after 2019, you would have 2020 Olympic year and then 2021 at the championship. Yep. Three big years back man, to back. Man, oh man, Hudson Bay. <laughs> Need some money. Team Visa. Get on it. Oh yeah, Team Visa, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we, we talked about how you got into Synchro. And let's make sure, right? Okay. You got into Synchro, and when did you know you were good? Um... Honestly, it took me a while to know before I was good. Uh, when I first started this sport, it was hard for somebody to, to coach me. Um, and I know this is going to sound really odd, but in the beginning, nobody really saw anything in me. Uh, I mean, I had nothing for what it took to become an Olympic athlete in this sport. Generally, uh, the Russians who dominate in our sport are really, really tall athletes. They're you know, six feet tall almost, and they're super flexible. I mean, flexibility is something that you need to have in this sport to be able to excel. And I had none of those things when I first started the sport. So um, a lot of times when I talk about my Olympic dreams or even making the national team, a lot of people would laugh. And it, you know, think that it wasn't possible. <laughs> but um, I was fortunate enough to have uh, one coach who just saw something in me and she continued on pushing me. And we didn't actually, we worked on my weaknesses every single day and my flexibility and my height is something that's out of my control. How, but how tall we, are you? I, I'm 5'5 five five now. Okay. So I'm five, oh, 5'5 five five now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Grown. <laughs> um, but I, we actually chose to work on, uh, choose to showcase my, my strengths, which is really my difficulty. And, you know, my spins is definitely one of my strengths, my height out of the water. And I'm one of the highest, if not the highest, in Canada, which is what made me stood out from all the other athletes and made me distinguish myself. But, yeah. That's... What, what did you have to do to get the flexibility? Uh, honestly, it's just something you have to do every single day, day in, day out, and be super disciplined. I mean, 
my splits is something that never came naturally. I was not flat in my splits on the ground, and it's something that I had to work on every single day. So when I do my homework, I my math homework, and I'd be sitting in a split position and doing my math homework and doing all that. <laughs> and it's, it's funny because um, if I stop for even a day, I start back at square one. Wow. So it's something that I had to, to keep on doing. I learned that lesson the hard way. I mean, there's some days where I thought, you know what, I could just pass out of my splits today. And then the next day I'd start back and then be where I left off when I first <laughs> wow. started. Yep. But some so, people are gifted yeah. with it, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very fortunate. It's a sell. Go home and do the splits. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how long do you have to be in the splits? On any, like, when you when you work on your flexibility, how long during the, of the day do you work on it? Like, that's not even really, I don't even know what, I'm speaking English. Right? <laughs> All right. I got you. <laughs> but, yeah, like, when you say, okay, I got to do my daily flexibility so I can yeah. keep my splits, like, how long is that? Um, it, it really depends. If I, my body isn't warm enough and I haven't stretched before I do my splits, uh, it's going to take me about 30 minutes to warm up properly. Okay. To be able to get my body temperature higher and then start stretching, warming up my splits, and then sitting in a slip position for five minutes. Okay. Uh, so I'd say five minutes each split position. Minimum, but it takes a while to be able to actually get to that five minutes. Right. Wow. Holy cow. And speaking of warm ups, like on a competition day, what do you do to warm up? Um, a number of things. Because our warm up consists of a dry line warm up and also an in the water warm up. So my dry line warm up is uh, you know, skipping or a little bit of running, jogging, light and gentle, just to get my body temperature up and wake up the body. And then some core stability exercises and then some specific injury prevention exercises. So in our sport, we have a lot of shoulder injuries and hip injuries. So I do a lot of um, strengthen exercises to reinforce the muscles so that I don't get injured. And then uh, what's very important for me personally is to do a good dry land flexibility warm up beforehand. So that includes my shoulder flexibility, my hips, my necks, my knees, my, my ankles. And that takes a solid hour of flexibility beforehand. And then that's my dry land warm up. And then once I get into the water, I'd say it's about 15, 10 to 15 minutes of speed swimming. So the first five minutes are pretty relaxed, just getting you know long strokes of freestyle. And then we start to pick it up when we do intervals. So uh, you know, two, three times a 200 IM. And then after we start getting to, to hypoxic sprints, so 10 times uh, 50 meters, 25 free, 25 under. A couple of times, so getting the heart rate up, um, getting our kind of anaerobic capacity again, and then start working on the routines. Wow. So it's a couple hours, yep. basically. <laughs> the routine is four minutes. Yeah. I'm always amazed at how much, I mean, and, and this is just like, but it's always, it's always amazing how much work people put in to do four minutes. Yeah, to do four minutes. Or even less, like some sports yep. are like 30 seconds yep. or whatever. And, and the work and the, the drive, and the, what, what keeps you motivated? Honestly, up until the Olympics, what kept me motivated was just that goal of, and that dream actually, of just going to the Olympic Games. That, that's what fueled my fire. And after Rio, I guess without having that dream, I mean, I've kind of had that check mark there, but just uh, surpassing myself every day, you know, becoming a better athlete every single day, achieving goals, trying to, to better myself as an athlete, that's what drives me every single day. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. I loved talking with you. It, she was she was so lovely. I have to tell I'm, you, I'm very jealous. Well, we'll have to get all of us in a room together, or at least on Skype together, or something, because she was yes. fantastic. And we talked. Uh, our, our our interview went for way over an hour. So, and you, I know you're only getting part of it here, listeners. But we'll save up her experiences in Rio, and she had another experience in world competition that is beyond amazing to me. I thought it was pretty unbelievable, but we'll save that for another day. And wanted to say thank you to listeners Meredith and Susan for your great questions. That Those were really interesting. I really loved hearing what she had to say about the music and how she got into the sport, which to me, like, I don't know how she goes to school. Because I know she's going to school, but like, how do you have time for classes, Jacqueline? <laughs> I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know how she has time to breathe, to be honest, but she doesn't need to because no. she's a synchronized swimmer <laughs> and she only needs to take a breath, you know, every three minutes. That's right. <laughs> They're unbelievable, those girls. Oh my gosh, uh, I was watching, we'll have some of the, uh, some of her competitions up on the website. 
just it's amazing and yeah. i'll put what her what she did in rio online but i'm also going to put this routine they did for uh, the 2015 pan am games which is incredible it's like to a very percussive song mm-hmm. and just the moves that they do with their feet and their hands it's they're they're really cool i it was very, just kind of blown away very fussy yeah, yeah. I'm, it's all very fussy. Might have watched it a few times today. <laughs> <laughs> it was preparation. It was your deck work for our broadcast today. <laughs> you were setting the mood for what was to come next. I think that's perfect. Exactly, exactly. So that was really cool. I'm really glad we started uh, talking about synchronized swimming. I'm looking forward to it, yeah, We've got to come back to it at some point because we've still got a I ways know. to go until Rio. But that was really, really cool. I really? know, and they take a lot of flack. They do. They do. And I think any skate, figure skaters, uh, rhythmic gymnasts, even artistic gymnasts sometimes take a lot of flack for these sports that are judged on artistic merit. Right. But the, the work that these athletes have to go through to be able to do what they do is amazing. So Unbelievable. I, and I don't know how to get these sports to be taken more seriously. When she was saying, yes, she'd rather do it without the makeup and with the simp, that may actually be better for the sport to make it more sport-like and less show-like. Right. Hmm. Let's get, That's a good point. Let's get, let's get rid of the makeup and the hair pieces mm-hmm. and just have them wear suits like the speed swimmers do or the divers do. Right. And I wonder how much of this is like just – a continuation of all the like synchronized synchronized swimming from old movies right know? i mean that was where it came from right. isn't it from the old mm-hmm. you know esther williams right right 1940s and 50s movies right. and so there's you know. that still that element of show so i guess i don't know but i do think that simpler would be better it's just like yeah. like she said why we have to wear these head we have to wear head pieces it's not fun but you got to do yeah. it so maybe that would actually help the sport right. be more respected. And I wonder how it's perceived in Europe. Oh, I wonder. I, I bet in, in, especially in Eastern Europe, it's It's got to be a bigger more respected. Thing. Yeah, yes. just like rhythmic gymnastics is. Right. And traditionally, gymnastics and figure skating were. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. More to I think we about. just gave us more work. <laughs> Do we yeah, ever which we finish a show without more work? No, and now we have a new business sideline of creating sequined shin guards for synchro swimmers. And you know, we'll have to get Pat Pearsall, our our right partner back, because she's got to show us how to get the right skin color mesh to make the skin <sighs> guard, the shin guards. I hear you, because that would be a detail that wouldn't go unnoticed. I know, Pat. We need you. Oh man. Okay, so we've got that on our to do list. But taken off the, the to-do list, a little Team Olympic Fever update, because Aaron Jackson, as we said a couple weeks ago, is competing in the inline speed skating world championships in the Netherlands. So I wanted to fill everybody in on how she's been doing over the week. How is she doing? I, I doing... had not checked on this. Okay, so she she has got one busy race card. So she's doing the 500 meters, the 1,000 meters, the 3K rate relay and the lap circuit sprint, which I don't really know what that is, but it's another event. I So she made it to the semifinals in the 500, uh, but she finished third in her heat. And some somebody else, I know, somebody else in her heat got disqualified for pushing, so I wanted to know more about that, like where that push came from, or if it affected our girl Erin at all. But that's the way that cookie crumbled. In the 1,000-meter sprint, she finished 16th. In the 3K relay, her team finished 9th. And then in the lap circuit sprint, she finished 3rd. Okay. Yeah. So we might not know what it is, but clearly Erin does. Yes. And she's very good at it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, good for her. I'm glad, yes. she had, I'm glad she had such a full race card. That's great right. Right. that she had qualified for all those events. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. So then, you know, she's going to move on to uh, move over to Utah sometime soon and and switch back, go, switch back to the ice. So <sighs> it's pretty crazy. She's really amazing. Oh, oh, my gosh. She really is. She really is. 
I also, I don't know if you saw this, but USA Bobsled and Skeleton had summer camp, and I noticed a few of our Team Olympic Fever members on the video. Yes. And so Lauren was there, and Nick Cunningham was there, and Josh Williamson was there, so. Yes. Did you see Nick Cunningham's new beard? I did see that. <laughs> <laughs> Almost didn't recognize him, but I I know. I recognized the, the head. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was very lovely. It suits yeah, him. It does, yeah. So that was cool to see them goofing off and yeah. helping some veterans and things like that. And then uh, the other day, I got a chance to catch up with Claire Egan on the telephone. So we're oh. going to have an update from her next week on oh, what's been going on. Yeah, because there's been, oh, big news in biathlon. Did you hear that the IOC pulled uh, their funding from the International Biathlon Union? I did. Oh. Now, did that happen before you talked to Claire or Yes, after? it did. Oh, it, it did. did. So you yes. guys could talk about that. We talked a little bit about that. We didn't have oh, a ton of time, but we we tried to get through the Olympics and what she's doing now with them and, and what she's... She's got at least one more season in her, she says. So talked about uh, what she's doing going into that. And then we talked about the situation with the IBU. And it's not a it's not a great situation because there's like criminal charges going on for some of the people yeah. who used to be at the top, but now that they're out, maybe things will get better. Yeah. But man, Ugh. losing your funding, okay. tough. Yeah, always happens the year after the Olympics. All the political shakeout. Right. Oh. Oh. I was celebrating when I started. You did this to me last week too. Oh, gosh, I gotta change. Man, oh, it's the heat. It's so you should have you should have started with the bad biathlon and finished with, with the good Aaron Jackson news. Hey, did I tell you that Aaron Jackson got third in the <laughs> lap lap circuit sprint at the inline speed skating world championship? Oh, I'm so happy for her. <laughs> she got engaged. <gasps> good for her. I know. <laughs> her dog was with them. And her dad took the pictures. Aww. Did. Got anything else? No, I'm just, I'm hot. Yeah, I'm hot too. So I think it's time to get into some AC. Yes. And yeah, next week we'll have Claire on the show again. And oh, what, you know what else? The We talked a little bit about you and I, Allison. The IOC is showing more transparency with their bid documentation for what the host cities need. So I think over this week, well, we can start plowing through it. Because All 300 pages of it. I yeah, know, we're going to read it so listeners don't have to. Right, and you can understand a little bit more about what goes into what a host city bid actually looks like. So that will be interesting because it's, it's interesting to see that the IOC is being transparent, but they aren't necessarily being brief while they're at it. Yeah, I'm hoping it's 300 pages because it's in both English and French. Knock on wood. Yeah. All right. So. See the play. <laughs> All right. On that note, we will get to our reading and we will see you back here next week with more Olympic stories. In the meantime, thanks for listening and keep the flame alive. Stay in touch. Email us at olymfever at gmail.com. That's O-L-Y-M fever at gmail. You can also leave us a voicemail at 530-763-3837. That's 530-70-FEVER. We're on Twitter at Olymp Fever, and you can join in the conversation at our Facebook group, Olympic Fever Podcast. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, keep the flame alive. Now we have a new business sideline of creating sequined shin guards for synchro swimmers. <laughs>